nobody knows what the regulatory procedures are, what the rights of the public are, because the one place where you could learn about it is on radio, television, in the newspapers, through the cable system, and they don't tell you because they're all interlocked in, in ownership. Another key issue in the pending congressional legislation is the comparative renewal process. In exchange for their licenses, managers of local stations are required to put on programs about ascertained community problems and needs. The reflection of local life and talent the reflection of minority interests, the presence of controversial discussion of important issues. These were provisions which the Commission claimed would hereafter be required of every broadcaster in reasonable amount as the condition of the renewal of his license. The public interest clause comes in superior to everything when it comes to the renewal of a license. When a station fails to provide suitable service, citizens may challenge its license under the comparative renewal process. This is what happened at WLBT in Jackson, Mississippi. We find upstanding citizens of this state of Mississippi had our license revoked, and it's the only time it's ever happened. The time was 1963, the height of the Civil Rights Movement. In Mississippi, Dr. Aaron Henry, a pharmacist who was head of the state NAACP, ran as a candidate for an ad hoc political group called the Freedom Party. His first complaint was the fact that they would not provide me, Aaron Henry, with the opportunity to purchase time in a political contest on the station. The group raised, as I remember now, around $300, a little more, and they gave it to me to go down the next day to buy time on TV for the campaign. Well, I came in to WLBT and asked for the right to purchase time on the station. And of course, the gentleman in charge said, you know, nigga, you know better than that. We ain't gonna sell you no time on this television station for politics. You, you crazy? You get the hell out of here. When he came and asked for sta uh, time, which I was not even aware of that he'd asked for time. I don't remember even talking to him, and I'm sure I didn't. Uh, he was not a candidate for governor. He had not announced he was not officially a candidate. And we were providing time to uh, Mr. Smith, the Reverend Smith, RTL Smith. And the manager of that station was Mr. Fred Beard. And he used all kinds of scare tactics about uh, if he would sell me the time, they'd find my body now floating in the river down there somewhere and find his body and find Mr. Collier's body and, and everybody that was tied in with it. We had uh, a number of people that would come and gather at our station when we were presenting uh, black speakers. Uh, Aaron Henry uh, was not one of the problems, but uh, Medgar Evers was. We'll be demonstrating here until freedom comes to Negro and Jackson, Mississippi. As a matter of fact, uh, Medgar Evers was killed after he'd made an appearance on WLBT. Dr. Everett C. Parker, then Director of Communications for the United Church of Christ, was in Mississippi gathering evidence of broadcasters' violations of the rights of black viewers. At a church meeting, he heard Aaron Henry tell about the TV station that refused to sell him airtime. Throughout the South, the, uh, the stations almost universally denigrated blacks. They wouldn't allow blacks on the air. When blacks were attacked, they wouldn't uh, let them reply. They didn't use courtesy titles with blacks. They didn't say Mr., Mrs., or Ms. No way. The people that were involved in making complaints about the station where they were trying to seek to have the license revoked had ulterior motives in what they wanted to do like Reverend Parker. He had a campaign going throughout the nation to do what he did here. Politics aside, when he monitored both Jackson television stations, Dr. Parker found almost no programming for the black community, who comprised nearly half the city's population. You didn't have any way of finding out what they had had on the air unless you, you actually watched and recorded every minute that they were on the air. So we did that, and then we went to the commission and we said uh, 
that this station was violating the act by discriminating against blacks. But there were a lot of other things that they were doing. It just happened that they, they were running uh, Ku Klux Klan programs, that they had a Ku Klux Klan bookstore on their, uh, their premises. We provided literature from purchase uh, for about a year at the Freedom Bookstore, which was at the station for a short period of time, that was strictly Americanism, promoting America, promoting our way of life, and it had nothing to do with racial motives whatsoever. I love Mississippi. I love her people. With Dr. Parker's help, Jackson citizens presented their evidence to the FCC and challenged WLBT's license. The FCC put the station on a one-year temporary renewal. To the surprise of the commission, we appealed to the circuit court, headed by Chief Justice Berger, who was then a circuit court judge. And we asked for standing. We asked the court to order the commission to have a hearing on the station. Until then, only legislators and parties with a financial interest, that is station owners, could initiate an action with the FCC or other federal agencies. In this decision, the court granted standing to citizens. It also called for a second FCC hearing on the WLBT case. Once again, the FCC exonerated the station. Not one charge was ever substantiated in a hearing that took years. All the charges were thrown out is not substantiated, no proof, or they never existed. And then we took it back to the circuit court, and in a precedent-shattering decision, on the morning that uh, uh, Justice Berger was sworn in uh, as Chief Justice, uh, he came down with his decision, and the court revoked the license. Took uh, pressures from, well, a lot of places, and finally the courts to get FCC to go along with the necessity of revoking the license of WLBT. If this case uh, uh, had been in California, it would never have been touched by an appeals court. But Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas and southern states were whipping boys back in those days. And uh, uh, it would be a feather in somebody's cap to take a station away from a licensee in Mississippi. This was the first and only time that a station lost its license because of failure to serve the public interest. Twenty-two years later, in 1986, the station became 96% black-owned. WLBT was the first minority-owned TV station in the country. And the man who could not buy campaign time in 1963, Aaron Henry, now sits as the station's chairman of the board with Vice Chairman Charles Young and the new WLBT the president, Frank Melton. License. It put every broadcaster in this country on notice, and it put them on notice uh, with respect to the fact that it can be done. You can lose your license for not serving the public interest and for not making sure that your station reflect, is reflective of the community that you're serving. Well, there was a time in, in, in this state and in this city when 40% uh, of the population was essentially left out. That is no longer true, thanks to the WLBT case. And really, the, the overall activity that you see now, literally hundreds of thousands of young blacks in all phases of television work, I feel somehow owe its genesis back to the WLBT story. Harvard Law Review said that this was the most important decision in administrative law in this century. And in many ways it was because it opened up the whole federal regulatory system. The, not only the Federal Communications Commission, the Pe Federal Power Commission, SEC, and so forth, to uh, public action. The only way that they really have been forced into real public interest uh, operation is when the public itself has uh, moved in and demanded that uh, its rights be served.